hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this, for this dialogue on uh, the great uh, John Lewis. Today is, uh, of course, uh, an, an incredibly important and special day in the, in the history of, of, of Georgia Tech. Um, a few years ago, soon after I arrived as, as uh, our, our new, then new president, we, we went through a, a whole uh, process to craft a new strategic plan. And out of that, we, we wrote a new mission statement, which was, we develop leaders who advance technology and improve the human condition. And, and that notion of leadership has made us reflect on what's the, the end game of what we, what we do here. When uh, this new facility was about to, to get reopened, we thought that there would probably be no better name than John Lewis to inspire all the students who are gonna be using this facility, meeting this facility and growing. Uh, no better name than John Lewis to inspire them to, to grow as leaders, to, to, to reflect on the fact that John Lewis himself was a student leader when he did um, what he did uh, for, for our nation. I, um, I had the privilege of uh, visiting with him a month before I started as president. He was very kind to open his office in downtown Atlanta and visit with me um, right a few weeks before I started my job. And um, of course, I've, I've always admired him and read about him and, and looked up to him as, a, as an example. And I could not believe I was sitting with the man himself in his office. And if, all I wanted was to talk about civil rights, but I didn't know if he was like, ah, oh, that, you know, maybe that's old stories for him. As soon as I mentioned those two words, the entire conversation, I could see the sparkle in his eye. I, uh, he showed me amazing uh, photos that he, that he treasured. He showed me from his office, many of you n knew that office that has great views of, of downtown Atlanta and Auburn Avenue, and he pointed at all the historic landmarks. And I could tell uh, how much he cherished that moment. And, and the whole time as after, after I left that, that meeting, I was thinking, all I wish is that when I am his age, I can just look back and have one moment, even if it's a, a, a fraction of the significance, but to, to see I was part of something important. And, and, and he had that, and, and he cherished that even uh, to his last moment. So anyway, I just I am thrilled that we're having this day today of celebration. And I could not think of uh, three better people to join us in a, in a conversation. Um, I'll introduce them, and I have a, a couple of questions, but this will work as a, really as a, as a dialogue. Kabir Segal is co-author of John Lewis, Carry On. It's a, it's a fabulous piece. I, um, I read it, and I listened to it. The audible version, in fact, uh, um, won a Grammy. And it is just a beautifully done uh, piece. Kabir um, has a new uh, John Lewis pretty much his entire life because he was a close family member. But then he had the privilege of spending some of those precious last months with him and, and getting him to, to talk, to, to share his philosophy and capture this in this book. The book is, is very interesting and in, in it's uh, organized by topics. There are very short, uh, very short uh, chapters on good days, on mentors, on heroes, on good trouble, on activism, on justice, on courage. One of them is on learning. And I thought that would be appropriate given where we are today. And he starts by saying, we didn't just show up and march. We had training and we developed a plan. We studied intently the philosophy of nonviolence. Like any discipline that you try to master, you need to constantly train, practice, and enhance your skills. Of course, my reading would not have earned that Grammy, but anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll listen, you'll listen uh, from, uh, uh, from Kabir in a second. We also have uh, Professor Doug Fleming. He is also an author of several books, but um, I just got my very own copy, thank you very much of Bound for Freedom, Black Los Angeles in Jim Crow America. Let's not forget that discrimination happened all over the United States and not only in the South. He is a professor of the School of History and Sociology. He specializes in the social and political history of the United States since the Civil War. 
and his current book project is the history of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That has um, uh, that work has earned him a Guggenheim Fellowship, and in 2012 he received the Institute's I called Faculty Teaching Award in recognition of faculty who provide outstanding instruction in core and general education um, undergraduate courses. And uh, next to him is another colleague of ours, Professor Joycelyn Wilson, who's an assistant professor in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication. She was born in the South, educated in Atlanta public schools. Uh, she's very proud of that. She's an educational anthropologist with research interest in hip hop studies in digital media. She served as the lead for the writing administration of the Black Media Studies minor that was approved by, by the Tech's Academic Faculty Senate last October. She's also working on a book. I don't have the copy yet because it will come out next year. And the title is The Hip Hop Aesthetic. Can't wait to get my hands on that, on that book. So thank you, uh, the three of you. I think we're gonna have a very interesting, different angles on, um, and let, let me start with, uh, with Kabir. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you've had a long uh, relationship uh, with, with John Lewis. You knew him as a family friend, as a mentor. You've known him in many different capacities. Let us, uh, tell us a little bit more about the man behind the, the name, the one you grew up getting to know and the one you knew in his, in his very last days. Sure, and, and thanks for having us in Georgia Tech. What a wonderful day, what a wonderful event, and you deserve real credit, Anel, for making this happen. I know that you have a team, but you had a vision to make this happen, and congratulations to you for achieving this. It's a really big honor for John Lewis and, and, and the congressman and the whole John Lewis family, um, so thank you. So I have memories of, of Congressman John Lewis from the late you know, 1980s when he would come visit my father. My father, um, uh, was an is an engineer, and he would come to my father's office. They would talk about politics and the, the local state of affairs, and there was too many roads being built in Georgia and Atlanta. And, and uh, you know, we kept this conversation going on through the 90s during the Olympics, and it was just an ongoing, you know, over 30 years conversation. And he always made time to chat by phone. He always made time to, to visit. And a lot of the stuff, you, you can see the documentary, you can read the books, but the John Lewis I knew was the man who liked to have milkshakes on the weekend. He liked uh, orange, uh, he, loved, he loved strawberry milkshakes, he loved chocolate milkshakes, um, he loved eating orange, uh, Chinese chicken, um, he loved going antiquing in, in, in DC. There was a wonderful antique place he liked to go. He was a collector of African art. He had a voluminous knowledge of African artists. And one thing he always kind of um, told me was, you know, I was thinking about, should I, should I go into public service? He said, he always, you should always, Kabir, work on creating stories and writing stories, because stories is what we pass on from generation to the, one generation to the next. And he always was trying to find a way to make time to, to talk to people, to go to school, to tell stories. And um, I think, you know, and I can talk about how the book came together. It was, you know, he got his, his terminal diagnosis, and, uh, and then we spoke. And he said, you know, I really want to, you know, reflect on, on what I'm going through. And when we spoke, it, it kind of occurred to me that this might be, you know, his final meditation. And so over the course of several months, um, we were in conversation to, to really capture what was on his mind. And the book, as Angel mentioned, was, is not, you're not going to get John Lewis the, the biography. You're going to get John Lewis almost like a Tuesdays with Maury in a reflection of what was on his mind in his final weeks. So it was very moving. And when he passed, I had this, uh, this collection of notes. And uh, there was a heavy burden to put it in his words and, and to publish it. And the book came out posthumously a year after he passed. So that's a little bit about our relationship. I'm happy to, to share more. And that's how the book kind of came together in, the, in those pages. And, and uh, of course, if you want to have the full answer to my next question, you're going to have to read the book. You're going to love it. Uh, but give us a little a, a gist of sort of his, how would you describe his leadership philosophy? I mean, I, I'm blown away about his sense of um, forgiveness, for example, and reconciliation, right? I mean, a man who was... You know, actually, he suffered. He was beat up. He was arrested. He tells a story about 
and bringing his, his book and his apple, <laughs> knowing that, I mean, and, and, and yet when you, meet, when you meet him, he was just like a, a source of sort of positive energy. What, tell us a little bit about what you learn in terms of his leadership personality, if you will. I think you would say love is the foundation of his leadership style. There's two, I've had the great fortune of meeting several Georgia public servants, and there's two people who would always say I love you. One is uh, Max Cleland, you know, say I love you, brother. Second is John Lewis, and they were actually friends, you know, and um, John Lewis would say that, you know, love is not part of our national conversation. How often do we say I love you? Like, it's almost weird to say it, it's almost naive to say it. But if we were to say it more often, we would have a public policy informed by mercy and compassion and love, not by vengeance and fear. He tells a story that uh, in 1961, he was um, beat up in, I think it was Rock Hill, South Carolina. He was attacked. John Lewis was trying to board uh, one of the first Freedom buses, Freedom Ride buses. He was one of the first Freedom Riders. He was attacked and bloodied and bruised. And he, he, he almost, he, I think he went unconscious. He was very, very uh, physically um, torn up inside and, and, and you know, you can see the, the wounds. And many years later, um, this same person who was a member of the KKK, he reached out, I think it was 40 years later, he reached out to Congressman John Lewis who said, I would like to come visit you in Washington, D.C. in your office. And of course, John Lewis obliged, and uh, it was a, a moment where you know, this man who had attacked John Lewis said, look, I'm getting old in my age, and I want to make right before I meet my creator. I want to make right before I meet my creator. And they hugged, and of course, John Lewis said, you know, I, I forgave this man a long time ago. Because when you forgive people, it's more to give yourself peace. You know, forgive people, you know, some, the apology may never come. But in this case, it did. So he, he forgave this man, and they hugged, and it was an emotional experience. But it's just a testament that, like, if you live life with a certain sense of character and ethics, like, people grow, people change. And how many times do you look through your cell phone and there's people you won't call because there was an incident or something. And he would say, lead with forgiveness. Be the first one to call. Be the first one to forgive. Be the first one to reach out. Too many of us don't do that. But I think that's how we can take John Lewis's mm -hmm. personal sense of leadership and translate it to our daily lives. You make the first move because it probably won't come from other people. So you got you to live in that way. So that's, that's one thing I learned from him is to put, put love and forgiveness in, at, at the centerpiece of not just a national leadership, but your personal sense of how you, how you live throughout the day. Ah, that's wonderful. Thank you, Kabir. Uh, Dr. Fleming, let's talk history. All right. Well, let's, <laughs> let's um, sort of bring us back to the, to the 60s, to the middle of, uh, of the movement. Um, he was, John Lewis was called um, uh, as a member, he was the last living member of the, of the so-called Big Six. Um, uh, he was, uh, of course, born in the 40s, and, um, and he carried out all that work during that time. Most of the other, uh, the, the, I guess, the other big five um, were born um, in the, either in the 19th century or in the early uh, 50s. So he was sort of a new, a new generation. Set up the historic context for us when, when he st stood out as a, as a leader. Absolutely. Uh, first, I want to just mention offhand that John Lewis spoke here in this building in, uh, I believe it was 1998. I was, uh, had just come here, and uh, I'll spare you the details, but it was just about, uh, <laughs> Stephanie, you were there, and uh, it was just about 100 feet from here in that direction. Doesn't exist anymore, that, that little auditorium. But that was the one and only time I got to meet John Lewis. And uh, he spoke with that soft, calm, powerful uh, voice. It was mesmerizing. I, and uh, it's a wonderful memory. And today's event brought that back to me. Thank you. Uh, and it is a great day. Uh, but the fact that uh, John Lewis was speaking at a major university, the fact that he was a congressman, the fact that he was a living legend uh, and a essential, an essential voice in the American political uh, arena, uh, 
is a minor miracle because to, to get to the context, he was, he was born uh, to a sharecropper family in rural Alabama in 1940. And this was, a, it was, it was not only a, a battling poverty, but also most specifically uh, battling Jim Crow. Uh, born into a, a suffocatingly uh, and viciously uh, enforced Jim Crow segregation, which wasn't really about separation. It was about subordination. It was about one group uh, keeping the other down. And the, the ideas of white supremacy were simply written into law and enforced... Uh, in all manners of ways, uh, including with uh, with lynchings, disfranchisement, uh, and all the Jim Crow laws and customs. So it was almost an impossible situation to get out of, and perhaps even to survive. And that he did so is I think a testament to to his his outlook early on, uh, when uh, when he looked out at the world, he looked out on a world that he was not comfortable with, that he could not abide. That uh, even as a young person uh, outside of Troy, Alabama, he he was a very serious young man. Uh, and he, his parents, he, he was deeply, deeply Christian uh, all his life, very, very devoted uh, to, to uh, not just God, but serving God by serving humanity. And his parents were of the idea that, as many were, uh, that religion and social problems should be kept separate. And you can see, you can understand in the situation they were in why that would be a, it would be important to try to just keep things calm on the social level uh, and look to glory in the, in the by and by in heaven. And John Lewis early on re rejected that point of view uh, and uh, quite astonished his family with the idea that things should change that uh, this, uh, this, this can't stand. And, um, and so from an early age, he, he began to, to move toward that, toward, the, toward that aim. He listened to Martin Luther King preach on the radio, and Martin Luther King was talking about the weapon of love and nonviolence and the need to, uh, to bring the Christian life directly into the political uh, uh, life and arena. So early on, he was, he was uh, I think, driven, challenged to, uh, to, uh, to make the world a better place. I don't think he became a congressman, a great leader, uh, an essential voice in America uh, by saying, I want to get up and out of here. I want to be somebody. I want to be a name. I think he simply moved in the direction that was on his heart, which was to change, this, to change the society where he lived, to change Troy, to change Alabama for the better, and to use the, uh, as he le would learn in Nashville, uh, when he went to uh, the seminary at age 17, he began to, to learn about Nonviolence and uh, and to devote his life uh, to it. So he had a mountain, a big mountain to climb, and he he set about doing it. So one of the of the of the themes in uh, Martin Luther King's writings, including of course in in that memorable letter uh, from the Birmingham jail, is when, when he talks about. Um, Justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, you do, you, you cannot, when all the, even, even moderate wide supporters were saying, wait, you don't need to create this trouble, 
things will change. In retrospect, was it too naive? I mean, would things have changed? Would we have had that those those um, acts enacted um, when they did, if it hadn't been for the actions of of that group? Was it inevitable? In a word, no. Uh, I think that you had to have the movement to have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of, of 65, um, and, and even the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, often called the Housing Act, um, which did include, by the way, a, a important section which gave federal protection to civil rights workers, something that had been sought for many years by the civil rights lobby and by the movement. So, so no, I think that you had to have the movement. I do not think that, I, I, I can't predict, I can't actually say what would have happened without it, but um, I don't think things were gradually getting better. In some ways, I think they were gradually getting worse. And uh, so it was not inevitable you did have to have people like John Lewis, like Diane Nash, uh, like other young people in the movement. And the movement wasn't just young people. It was, there, was, there was some old folks scattered in there, uh, take up for my age. And uh, so I think it was absolutely necessary. And you know, in some ways, John Lewis shaped his times d directly uh, he was also shaped by his times. Um, so it's an interesting question of leadership, but uh, he certainly made the most of it. Thank you so much. We'll get back to that. But um, Dr. Wilson, I am really intrigued by how new generations now process, understand, are aware of or not of what happened now 60 years ago and even before that, um, you, uh, your, your scholarship and your work is fascinating, is that at that intersection of, 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 of culture and, and technology, uh, you teach many of our students to, to understand, to dig deep into hip hop, to get into deeper layers. So uh, from that perspective, um, what do you think is the awareness of, 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 of new generations as to the work of those, those giants? Or um, and maybe, maybe do you have any recommendation about what it is we should be doing to keep those ideas alive and, and well? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me for, to this. Um, in 2017, I got an opportunity to work on the John Lewis Task Force. Um, then Congressman, I mean, uh, Councilman Andre Dickens put together, curated a, a task force of folks around the city, some of which are here, to, to establish while he was here to give him his flowers. And we came together to think about exactly your question, how do we ensure that his legacy is um, archived in a way in the city where the next generation would not lose sight of who he was and what he stood for and the fact that he represented the city for so long. And so um, we worked very hard to turn Freedom Parkway into John Lewis Freedom Parkway. Hmm. Um, we worked very hard to establish a um, an exhibit at the Hartsville-Jackson Airport. If you've ever gone in there, you see it on the wall. Um, we worked very hard to make sure that his legacy was established and um, concretized in a way that new generations you know, would ask, well, who is John Lewis when you're driving down 75-85? I think it's really important to note that Having the insight and the foresight, um, Mayor Dickens at now, then Congress, um, Councilman Dickens, I think that he had the foresight to understand that it was important for a city like Atlanta to celebrate 
Congressman Lewis while he was still here uh, with us and to ensure that the next generation understood what he offered. And for the hip hop generation to be at the seat of doing that. I mean, Andre is part of that generation. Um, he's part of that post-civil rights hip hop generation. And, and I wanna be clear when I'm talking about hip hop, I'm not talking about rap music specifically. I'm talking about a cultural aesthetic. I'm talking about a movement of young people who were born following the civil rights movement, following the acts that you mentioned, who uh, some benefited and some didn't necessarily benefit. And they did exactly what he implored young people to do, and that's to get in good trouble and to be audacious about expressing oneself and expressing oneself through a set of artistic elements, whether that's music, whether it's dance, but the whole point of it was to gain knowledge of self and understand who one, who you are, what your gifts are, and how to give those to the world. And one of the most profound elements of the aesthetic is this notion of schooling and education. So I believe that Congressman Lewis's legacy, um, he would tell this generation of young folks to continue to use education as your vehicle for not only developing your computational and technological capacities, but to also use it as a vehicle to um, develop your leadership and your social justice capacities. There is a, there's a declaration in um, the hip hop aesthetic, it's called to get in where you fit in. And to get in where you fit in is exactly a remix of getting in good trouble. And what I love about him receiving the Ivan Allen Social Courage Award, courage is about getting in where you fit in, being audacious, being, and not really, and knowing that on the other side, you're gonna catch some flack, that it isn't gonna be an easy task to get in good trouble, to find where you fit. And I think through education and what I teach my students is, you can't come to a place like Georgia Tech and get these really dynamic degrees and not do something with them to make the world a better place. And I think that's what he represents and I think that's what he would um, say to the next generation. And we use rap music, we use film, we use um, all these different artistic expressions um, to have conversations and debates about how one can change the world and be courageous about it and being audacious and having the audacity to actually do it because that's what he represents. And, um, and I think that's what he would encourage young folks to do. Yeah, and I'm, I'm fascinated by, by your work and how you find the, the means to connect with, with students. One, one of, the, of the projects that, that um, I find fascinating that I know you've played a key role in um, is a project in partnership with Amazon Ear Sketch, where we use uh, music as a as a hook to bring uh, high school students in. Um, they think they're going to be learning about hip hop music, and they end up actually learning how to code in Python. So uh, I, I find it masterful. So I guess my my question, just the, in the same way that that that, that music has can be used to bring students into certain things. This idea of, 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 of music and the arts to inspire students to, to grow as leaders, to develop that courage. Um, can music do that? Or can other forms of art effectively do that? Yes, it always has. It, it isn't significant to hip hop. Um, it's very much a part of um, the African American cultural tradition to use music and art, whether it's blues, whether it's jazz, you know, whether it's soul and R&B, you know, to use music and art as a platform to express oneself, particularly around issues of justice. And um, with Your Voices, you're talking about Your Voices Power. It is a project between Amazon, um, Seismic here on campus, the Center for Education, Integrating Science, Mathematics, and Computing, and um, EarSketch, and the Hip Hop 2020 Innovation Archive and a methodology that we use 
to teach students how to get beyond the turn up, to get beyond what these lyrics just say on the surface. To, we have a set of seven principles that we ask students to mine for in the lyrics so that they can rewrite and remix their own lyrics to go with the songs that they're remixing. And it's really great because you have artists like Pharrell or Alicia Keys or Khaled. Um, we're working with um, Daddy Yankee on the um, Latin version. They donate their music to the project. They're called stems, and stems are really all of the melodies that are created to make a song. And so they literally will donate the stems to the project, and students will use EarSketch to create remixes of the song. And when um, we went through the early parts of the, the pandemic, but we also went through a justice pandemic, a social pandemic, uh, uh, Amazon decided that, hey, we need to have students remixing these lyrics as well to write their own stories to pair with the songs that they're writing. And so they not only remix new songs, they remix, um, they remix the music, they remix the lyrics. And it was amazing what came out of that. Uh, the students from, there were 1,500 entries. Uh, there were five winners. One was a young lady from Clayton County. Um, and EarSketch has now reached their millionth user. We're celebrating a million users with EarSketch in a couple of weeks. So I always have felt like music and art intersected with um, race and justice and integrated in the curriculum was really the way that students should learn to develop those capacities. I went to Benjamin Mays High School here in Atlanta. I was in the Mays, I was in the Math and Science Academy. So I saw my teachers doing this before it was called hip hop pedagogics. It was just really good teaching. And so I think that we have to, in the spirit of John Lewis, I think we have to push against anything or anyone who tries to eliminate the integration of those concepts in curriculum because it really is the way that we're going to balance out the equilibrium of democracy in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Let me ask, in, and I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Kabir, but one of the, of the remarkable things of the civil rights movement and, um, and the peaceful techniques that were used by John Lewis, Martin Luther King, is that it took a lot of learning and training in practicing, this was not just about showing up at the lunch uh, uh, counter. There had been a ton of work uh, beforehand to be able to do that uh, effectively, effectively. There was a lot of discipline, a lot of learning, um, which uh, I guess uh, as you grow as a leader, as many of our students in, 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 at Georgia Tech, that it is not just the passion or, or the commitment to the cause, but the, 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 the training that goes to, to become an effective leader. Any lessons that, that you can share with us? Maybe some of the stuff reflected in the book or? Yeah, there was a, really a boot camp of, of learning and how to, how to be a good leader in, in, the civil rights, <clears throat> in the civil rights vein. I think um, part of the training was these young people would sit at counters and their friends would yell at them and they would have to endure this kind of assault for minutes. How long can you sit at a counter with someone yelling at you or pouring hot water on you or doing something? So when the time comes when you actually do it, you've done it before, right? So, you know, with John Lewis, he would often wear a suit in college. He was almost single-mindedly dedicated to this issue of wanting to integrate and, sit and, and uh, desegregate the, the Woolworths and the, and the, and the counters. Um, and it's, it really took a lot of, what, what I found was interesting was they used a lot of, um, I would say calculation, strategy, on how to stage the marches, when to stage the marches. They weren't marching in the middle of the night. They were marching at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., so it could be broadcast right on the evening news, right? Because they wanted to get the leverage of, let's get a lot of eyeballs on this movement. That took a lot of thought. That took a lot of not, let's, let's, not, let's, let's not just react. Let's plan the event. Let's make sure we have our best trained foot soldiers who are going to be leading this march. <clears throat> John Lewis, there's a reason John Lewis was at the head of the, the Selma march, because he had the training, he had the experience. 
and, uh, and he wanted to be there, and he had done it before. And so, you know, when you train, um, it prepares you for these, these moments in life, and his life changed. I mean, think about that. One Sunday changed American history. Bloody Sunday changed American history. It was when millions of Americans started to realize the violence that was happening. And John Lewis was preparing for that one moment, maybe unwittingly, for over a decade. You know, he wrote that letter to, to Martin Luther King, I think when he was 15 or 16. And his training began at that moment. So um, one thing I just want to say also is in the Student Center, um, which is so wonderfully named, I was reading, uh, there's, a, there's a great um, uh, writer, Kevin Kelly, he was a founding editor for Wired Magazine, and he turned 70 recently, and he came up with a list of lessons, right? And some of them were quite practical, like always take the stairs, or never, um, if you're going to rent a car with a credit card, don't get additional insurance because your credit card <laughs> But, but, um, but one of them I liked, he says, always read the plaque. Always read the plaque. And I don't know, well, what, what you've done here, what your team has done here, um, I can only imagine people who come to the school. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who don't know who John Lewis is. You know, in Atlanta, he's well known. But a lot of people, I was overseas, a lot of people don't know who he is. When people come to the school, how many people are going to Google who John Lewis is now? How many students who don't grow up in Georgia are going to come to the school and say, all right, let me Wikipedia this guy? and maybe write a project about her, or maybe, uh, and read the plaque. So millions of people are gonna come through this place, and because of what you guys have done here, they're gonna learn about John Lewis, maybe write about him, maybe be inspired by him. Um, you know, where I went to school, we, it wasn't called the John Lewis Student Center, I wish it was. And um, so that's, I just wanted to comment on that, because I think what you're doing here is you're continuing this legacy of learning in the civil rights vein that all these young leaders had the training, and to think of all the mischief that happens in these confines, and all these people that are going to want to challenge. I'm sure there's some some disruptions that you may be for or against. I'll be, I'll be the target of. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's. Yeah. <laughs> so get ready. Yeah. Right. So there'll be there'll be a, a good trouble at your at your doorsteps, but it's it's really you know a credit to to the, the learning and the forward thinking that the institution is embodying. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kabir. Um, uh, Dr. Fleming, so just like we hope our students will be inspired by the history of, of John Lewis and, and the other leaders of the civil rights movement, they themselves had their own sources of inspiration, right? And even the whole idea of, uh, of peaceful protest didn't come out of just nowhere. They didn't invent it. They studied it. Again, give us a little bit of uh, maybe a historic context of where did those ideas come from and where did these people figure that that was going to be the path to drive real change? Well, I think uh, several mentors, if that's what you yep. uh, mean, uh, come, to, come to mind. Uh, King, obviously, we've talked of, uh, about from an early uh, age, was a, a mentor to Lewis. And, uh, but I would, and uh, when, uh, when SNCC was organized, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was organized. Uh, Ella Baker, I think, was important to all of to uh, to all of the members of SNCC, of which John Lewis was one, and uh, later chair of SNCC. Uh, Ella Baker uh, taught that uh, her, one of her famous phrases was that uh, we don't need strong leaders. Not sure I agree with agree with that, but uh, I certain. But her point was very powerful, which was to say that um, that uh, if you move into a community uh, to organize to uh, start a movement, uh, create a create a community within uh, that that neighborhood. Not imposed upon them, but built from the grassroots up, and, a, and an organization, a community that would that would uh, remain once the marches moved on to some someplace else. So Ella Baker was important. I think John Lewis picked up on that. Uh, I think Jim Lawson. We haven't mentioned James Lawson, a minister who had been to India uh, and. New King and really helped fashion this this um, this ideal, this ideology, this strategy of nonviolent civil disobedience, and 
I think Lewis just soaked that up. When uh, Lewis was, what, 17, he, he left Troy and went to Nashville uh, to the American Baptist Theological Seminary. And that's where students were going to listen to James Lawson speak about nonviolence and the need to be active uh, and to do so with the weapon of love and forgiveness. And Lewis just embraced that message of James Lawson uh, uh, and lived it his, his, his whole life. Um, it saved him, he said. Uh, I don't know about that, but it certainly, certainly was, he cert Lawson certainly was the, uh, a key mentor in his, his college years, including later when he went to, to Fisk. Um, so I, I think those, those three, um, and perhaps especially Lawson, was, was uh, very important. And he knew the importance of leadership. He idolized King. He idolized Lawson but he also got busy. <laughs> so, so I think that you do need mentors. You do need, uh, you do start from scratch. Nobody starts knowing the whole thing. And he kept his eyes open, kept learning along the way, stayed anchored in his, the original teachings. I know I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't forgive that much or love that much. But I think John Lewis did. Thank you. And Dr. Wilson, can those ideas be uh, amplified through hip hop? The ideas of, of forgiveness, of love, of peaceful protest? Peaceful protest. So um, I think that you have a generation that challenged a lot of those uh, peaceful protest approaches, right? Um, and it was done oftentimes in a healthy way. One of the things I wanna point out is in 2008, when um, Barack Obama won United States president, uh, there is a local hip hop artist who goes by the name of Jeezy. Um, his real name is Jay Jenkins and has done some, a few things over here at Georgia Tech. Um, he wrote a song called My President and invited Congressman Lewis to the video shoot. And he showed up. He's in the video. And I think, you know, what that did for this generation was acknowledge the fact that our elders actually see us. Although there may be some dissension in approach or some differences around how to address many of these issues peacefully um, or sometimes non-peacefully. Uh, I think that what he did in that moment was said that I see you. And a lot of times folks wanna be seen. And I believe that's the crux of mentorship is being able to see someone and acknowledge that they may not have the same approach that you may have, but we all have the same mission. So I think that mission is still there that mission of equity, that mission of justice, um, that mission of being able to have access to resources, um, and how one goes about to get it, how about getting it might be a little different, but I believe at the end of the day, there is um, camaraderie around the goal. And we see that remixed in the music, we see it in the films, I mean, when you look at the portfolio of someone like Ava DuVernay, uh, she brings a lot of these topics to life via film. You know, she did Selma, she did 13th, right? Um, she produces Queen Sugar, although it's creative fiction, uh, many of these issues of justice and equity are written into, the, into those stories. So we see a lot of that. I mean, we love Outcast, right? Um, many of those stories that are told are about liberation and about justice. It may come with a little bit of profanity, but it's there, right? So I think 
um, what ultimately happened with the post-civil rights slash hip-hop generation, especially those who grew up here in Atlanta, who could go to Kroger or go to Nordstrom Rack and actually see John Lewis, you know, like that was one of, the, I don't want to underestimate what it means to be from Atlanta growing up during a time when many of these civil rights leaders were living in your neighborhood. And it can really create a false sense of security when you go out of the city of Atlanta, because it's not like this. Atlanta is not perfect, but Atlanta is definitely special in that way. And so I don't want to underestimate that part. And um, so you're going to see a lot of those things remixed in the stories and the media that's produced. And I try my best to expose students to that legacy so that they understand that you have a task. You know, you just can't get this degree and just be out there getting your bag and not making a difference while you're doing it. Right. I'm going to give you, the three of you, a challenging closing question. Uh-oh. <laughs> Which is, the three of you have spent quite a bit of time reflecting on, on John Lewis, reflecting on leadership. If you have to encapsulate it into what is the one lesson you hope 10 years, 20 years from today, those students who come to this building and hopefully will read the plaque, what is that lesson, that nugget? This is in the category of, I think it was Mark Twain, if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. You don't have the time and I want the short letter. No, that's, that's, that's. Yeah, I would say it sounds um, really innocent, but it's hope. Um, one of the things Congressman uh, Lewis, which, which broke his heart towards the end of his life, was the violence that was happening in 2020. Um, because there was a certain thing that, oh, nonviolence was uncool, or like, how do you actually say nonviolence in, in the wake of Trayvon Martin or Ahmed Arbery? And I think it takes a real commitment. John Lewis was nothing but <laughs> committed, and some people would say even stubborn to a point of being We've got to stick to nonviolence because at 10 years from now, we're going to be facing some other challenges, some other complexities. And it's so easy for you to, it's so easy to become violent. It's so easy to be cynical. It's so easy to, um, you know, to, to spar with your neighbors. It takes reflection and decency to figure out how to actually make change happen. And so I hope that. That hope, he would always say, never lose hope. It's going to change. It's, he said that in 19, 1960s. And he would say that in 2020, never lose hope. It's going to change. It's going to change. It's, people are going to grow. So I think that he would say nonviolence doesn't go out of fashion. And we need to get, we need people to keep on reminding us that, like, you know, we need to live in harmony. And that sounds so innocent and so naive, but actually there's, there's so much wisdom in that um, to stick with that nonviolence for sure. Dr. Fleming. I think it would be keep moving. Don't let anyone tell you to stop. If you're determined, if you're trying to make a difference in the world, if you're trying to change the world, which John Lewis was, don't let people stop you. Keep moving. Thank you. Dr. Woodson? I would say, I'll, I'm going to put it in these terms. He didn't say it this way, but I think that he did this. And all of us in here, we've flown before. And the first thing that a flight attendant tells us is to put your own oxygen on first before you help anybody else, even small children. And I think there's so much value in that, because if you can't breathe, how can you help anybody else breathe? And I think what John Lewis is, he put his oxygen on. He realized, you know what? I have to, I have to learn, I have to teach myself how to even engage in what it is that I'm seeing and how to create change in a very violent and very um, subordinating type world that I live in. And I know that I can't go I can't use darkness to do it. 
I'm going to have to use light to do it. Because, I mean, you have to, I would, I would think that there was a lot of resentment, right? Probably even more than we have now because we got some options. But then you're growing up, you're poor, um, you're also um, growing up during Jim Crow, so you're racially subordinated. So you have to deal with a lot before you can help anybody else. And so he put his oxygen on first, whether that was through education, whether that was through love and hope, uh, you know, whether that was attending these church meetings every Tuesday, um, making sure that he knew how to um, respond if he was put, when he was put in a situation where his life was in danger. So I would say, you know, put your oxygen on first before you try to help anybody else, even small children. I'm, I'm impressed by how the, uh, they had no warning of my, uh, my closing question. I'm impressed of, uh, I give you A's to all of you. Uh, <laughs> but by the way, just um, uh, uh, interestingly, by the way, if you um, uh, listen to the audible version of, uh, of uh, Carry On, the, um, the preface is, uh, is, is by, um, Ambassador Young, Andy Young, and he reads it himself in the audible version. And it's actually quite funny. Because he tells the story, talk about being stubborn. He tells the story of how John Lewis fought against the construction of what is now called the John Lewis Freedom Parkway. And, uh, and Ambassador Young has a lot of fun talking about the, uh, uh, how interesting that at the end it was built and they managed to put his name on it. Um, I, I'll just close by just a, maybe a, a, a personal story. Um, in, in, in 2012, when uh, Beth and I moved to, to Virginia, and, and I was invited, honestly, I was invited to speak at an event. I, I was a little, I didn't know exactly what I, it is that I had agreed to do. It turns out I was one of the speakers at the 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. And, and when I showed up and, and I was led to, to the Lincoln Memorial, and it was a glorious August day. It was absolutely beautiful, sunny, beautiful day. The, the, the whole mall was, was full of people. And, and when it was my turn, and I had to walk through the Lincoln Memorial to the very center and, and stand by the podium, and I looked out, and I, I, I don't know if my legs were shaking or my mind was shaking, but I was, this is unbelievable. A moment I will never ever forget. Um, the prior speaker was the, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, as a matter of fact, uh, talk about the, 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 that line of influence and thinking in, in leadership. But my, my thought then was, oh my gosh, I mean, that is the moment when Martin Luther King and John Lewis and that generation, the world was looking at them. It was their moment. The nation was listening. And they seized that moment. And they used that moment to really do what had to be done and to say what had to be said. And I keep thinking, we will have our own, maybe not as dramatic, but we will, and our students will have those moments in life where you have a chance to make a difference. And the question is, will you be ready? Thank you so much for being part of this great conversation. Thank you.